So turn, if you would, to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. As we continue, continue our look at this, really the, the final letter of the Apostle Paul, um, and, the, and the importance that Paul stresses on, uh, really throughout this letter, on the Word of God and holding fast to it, we come now to a chapter, chapter 3, that concludes with a couple of verses. The last two verses of this chapter are of paramount importance to our belief as Christians and also to our understanding of God's message to us. Um, and just by way of footnote here and maybe a brief warning or heads up, um, this message is going to be a little more topical or doctrinal than Gabe's um, have been so far. We're going to move around just a little bit as we stress the importance of the scriptures, using especially chapter or verses 16 and 17 as our jumping off point. Now, we believe that all of God's word is important, but there are those specific passages that teach us some fundamental Christian doctrines. There are those passages of scripture that clearly and succinctly lay out a, a theology of a, of a specific doctrine. So, for example, if you want to know and understand the love of God, if you're talking to someone about the love of God, you're likely to end up at some point in the discussion in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're probably also going to tie in, I, I hope, 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We get rich doctrine of the, of the nature and character of God our Savior from simple passages of Scripture. But we need to be careful not to separate them from the whole of Scripture. So to carry on with that example of God's love, there are some who believe that the, that the love of God is the extent of who he is. And they, in so doing, they forget or they disregard the Bible's teaching on his holiness, for example, or his wrath or, or the coming judgment, his calls for obedience. And so as we come to chapter 3 of this epistle, we're going to take a look at a at a topic that is of grave importance for Christ's church. In fact, this is a doctrine upon which the church will either stand or fall. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But he also promises to judge those who call themselves churches yet fail to keep his commands. If you don't believe me, read the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation where he addresses those churches. Yet his true, true church will stand. And it will be a church that stands on his word and does not align itself with the world. So for this session, we're going to look at Scripture, along with, because it's me, along with a dab of history, to help us to understand where we have been, where we are now, and what our foundation must be as we move into the future, especially as we see the day drawing near. We are essentially planting a flag on these important doctrinal issues, issues that have become divisive in our society as a whole, even in our own neighborhood, and for many of us, issues that are divisive even in our own families. See, what you believe about God's Word will inform what you believe about all matters of life, from gay marriage, so-called, to issues of gender and sex, about the sanctity of human life, really about everything that we can encounter, all matters of life and belief. So bear with me as we jump around just a little bit here in the scriptures. But as I said, we are going to spend a bulk of our time in verses 16 and 17. But I want to read the whole chapter and, and see as we read for, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, see if this doesn't sound like the times that we live in today. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. But understand this, 
that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's just stop and ask God to help us. Lord, we do pray that you would um, help us today to understand the importance of your word, the importance of holding fast to it, your word that is breathed out as the very breath of God, that breathes into us new life just as just as you breathed into Adam life. But this is an eternal life, a life in Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us what we need this morning as we need Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just a little bit of history. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 25 years later... October 31st, 1517, so about 504 years ago, a Catholic priest and a professor of theology at Wittenberg University in Germany walked up to the door of the castle church and posted a document announcing a public debate concerning the sale of indulgences by the church, the Roman Catholic Church. The document was titled, The 95 Theses on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, and the priest who nailed it there was Martin Luther. By the 1500s, the church had become so corrupt that in order to pay for the renovations at St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican, that under the leadership of Pope Leo X, the church began to sell the forgiveness of sins. There was a saying that was going around at the time, or at least is sort of attributed to the time. It's connected to a priest named Johann Tetzel. And it goes something like this, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. But this was not the only scandalous activity that the church was perpetuating. For a thousand years, humanity, at least in Europe, lived in what we sometimes call the Dark Ages. It was certainly a dark age of the church, because the light of the gospel, while it was not extinguished, it certainly was not shining very bright. Steve Lawson describes church life in these times like this. He says, The church was greatly in need of reform. Spiritual darkness personified the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible was a closed book. Spiritual ignorance ruled the minds of the people. The gospel was perverted. Church tradition trumped divine truth. Personal holiness was abandoned. The rotten stench of man-made traditions covered pope and priest. The corruption of ungodliness contaminated both dogma and practice. 
was during this time, with a few minor kind of localized exceptions, the church, essentially the only church, was the Roman Catholic Church. There were no Baptist churches. There were no Methodist churches. There were no non-denominational churches, just the Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Orthodox Church in the East. So when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door in Wittenberg, he unwittingly started a revolution that would forever alter the face of human civilization. At least in the West, really throughout the known world. What you may not know is that the Protestant Reformation brought a revival to the church in areas such as, for example, congregational singing. See, up until then, all of the singing in the church was done by professional clergy. Just imagine that for a moment. Don't. It was the Reformers who translated the Bible into the languages of the people, and some of them, um, even the pre-Reformers, were put to death for that. But in translating it to the language of the people, the common language from Latin, which was not known by people, it allowed it to be accessible to, to common Christians. And because of the invention of the printing press, and Gabe referenced this earlier, because of the invention of the printing press, books became easier and, and cheaper to print and distribute, and, and people actually began to learn to read. We are grateful to the Reformers for restoring the the preaching of God's word to the central place, not only in the, in the worship services, but in the, in the lives of the people. It was Martin Luther himself who restored the cup of communion to the people, allowing Christians to partake of both the bread and the wine. It was the Reformers who emphasized the ministry of, of every member of the church, the priesthood of all believers, instead of restricting ministry to the clergy, and, and probably most importantly, it was the Protestant Reformation that took seriously the question, what must I do to be saved? And they searched the scriptures for the answer. See, when someone asks that question, what must I do to be saved? We want to be absolutely sure that we get the answer correct, don't we? But up until the Reformation, the only place, really, that the common person could find the answer was in the church. And the church's answer for many centuries was wrong. See, today you can Google it. You can Google that question and come up with millions of different answers. You can ask Siri, although she'll probably get it wrong. You can ask your neighbor. You can pick up your Bible and start reading. You can ask your pastor, who will hopefully say, as Jesus did, repent and believe. But in medieval times, you would ask a priest, and that priest would describe salvation as looking something like this. You must be baptized as an infant, confirmed as a youth, married as an adult, and receive extreme unction or last rites on your deathbed. Each of those ceremonies, along with ordination for those who would become priests, each of them convey or infuse grace when administered by an ordained priest. Then that grace is supplemented throughout your life through the regular confession of sin, specifically to a priest who would then absolve you after penance, and also through receiving communion or the Eucharist, but after you were dead, you're still not guaranteed of your salvation, but you would go to purgatory for an unspecified period of time where you would continue to pay the penalty for your sin until finally you might be allowed into heaven. So what happens when the teaching of the church collides with the teaching of the Bible? In other words, who has ultimate authority? Who has the ultimate authority to answer the question? Is it the, what they call the magisterium, the, uh, the official clear teaching of the church, or is it the clear teaching of Scripture that has authority? Well, the medieval church put authority in matters of faith and practice in the hands of the Pope. He was known as Christ's vicar on earth. It was the Pope who had the, had the power to authoritatively interpret Scripture and tradition and the church fathers and the, and the church councils. 
The Pope even had the authority to develop new teachings, such as purgatory and the, and the selling of indulgences for the forgiveness of sins, which are not anywhere in Scripture. But then men such as Martin Luther came along and they challenged the authority of the Pope. And when he was put on trial at his famous Dita Worms, Luther defended his writings and his teachings in front of his emperor, in front of the whole assembly of German princes and church representatives by very famously saying this. Luther said, Since then your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply. I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they've contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Amen. His conscience was captive to the word of God. Eventually, as the Reformation pressed on, God raised up other leaders, and, and over time, the, the principles that would drive the Reformation were articulated and, and summarized in what we call the, the five solas of the Reformation, the five alones. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Sola Fide, faith alone. Sola Gratia, grace alone. Solus Christus, in Christ alone. And Soli Deo, Gloria, for the glory of God alone. I know not everybody is history nerd like me. I know not everybody cares about some of this, the history behind how we got here. But I believe these things are of vital importance to our understanding. At least clinging to the doctrines are of vital importance to our understanding of the very nature of salvation. You see, that word alone, sola, acts as a guard for the simple truths that, that Scripture alone is our only unmistaking inspired authority for faith and life, and that we are justified by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and all for the glory of God alone. So, having said all of that by way of introduction, let me give you a rough overview of 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we kind of speed along to those last couple of verses. But don't miss verse 1. Look at this again. 2 Timothy 3, 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. In the last days there will come times of difficulty. The preacher of Hebrews begins his message, the book of Hebrews, like this. Long ago, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. We are in these last days. And a simple reading of those opening verses of chapter 3, they're going to prove that for us. You can read verses 2, 3, and 4 in particular. And you probably don't need... Um, definitions of what those sins are. We probably don't need to go through each one and, and give, see examples for them because they're, they're pretty self-explanatory. You can probably read through that list of, of sins and, and, and think of specific names. I'm not asking you to, by the way, but you probably naturally can. You can think of specific groups of people. You've seen some of those sins celebrated on television and, and even in commercials. And if you're honest, some of them have probably cropped up in your own heart. And you've experienced this. Have you experienced people in your family, unbelievers even, who used to condemn certain sins as gross and immoral, and yet at best now are apathetic to them? Eh, who am I to judge? We've seen that happen, haven't we? It wasn't that long ago when even unbelievers would have condemned the sins that are now celebrated all throughout our society. In the last days, people will love their own godless character, is what he is saying here. They will shun and mock God's moral law. 
Christians who live in ways opposite of those, that list there in verses 2, 3, and 4. Christians who live opposite in those ways uh, will be uh, vilified and, and demonized, opposed. But the kicker for me as we look at this is verse 5. Look, look at verse 5 again. Having the appearance of godliness, but avoiding its or denying its power. They're pretending to be godly. They have a phony piety, but they deny the, the power of the Holy Spirit. They deny the power of the gospel to change, li- change lives. We could say that they have a godless godliness. Godliness in air, air scare quotes. Let, let me give you one he- headline that perfectly, I think perfectly illustrates what this looks like. Um, this... Uh, Verse 5 again, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. This is one headline from USA Today from October 10th, 2021, this week. This is the headline. I'm just going to read the headline. I'm a Christian minister who's had two abortions. Here's how faith informed those decisions. I'm guessing you might have seen that headline this week, that article that went around. The Apostle Paul here goes on to say that In these times of difficulty, there will be predators and oppressors, opposers. That's what he's talking about in verses 6, 7, and 8. Let me just say that, um, let me read those verses, 6, 7, and 8. But among, um, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Again, this is those who have crept in through the church and are creeping into families. Let me just say that when Paul talks about weak women burdened with sin, he's not mocking. He's not being somehow misogynistic. He has a particular heart for them. I have no doubt that some of them are, are entrenched in sin. Some of them are probably indifferent to it. Some are crushed with guilt and they need the gospel's redemption and and Timothy's pastoral care. He needs to teach them what the gospel is. He needs to remind them that, that in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation. They don't need some fake, godless Christian supposed Christian minister who writes an op-ed in a national newspaper to celebrate her own sin and encourage others to do the same. People like this, he says in verse 9, are obvious fools. Look at this. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, just as it was for those other two men. But then Paul writes in verse 10, You, however... And he goes on to explain in the, in the second half of the chapter the nature, essentially the nature of true discipleship. He'd already urged Timothy when he wrote his first letter to him in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I think it's verse 16. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist, persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. And then he takes this another step and he says in verses 10 and 11, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Kind of an interesting side note that he's in prison as he writes that. The Lord rescued past tense me. He's in prison and we believe this was his last letter and that he was executed shortly after this. And yet he is confident in the Lord's rescue. He is essentially saying, you have imitated me. And what is Paul doing as he says those things but imitating Christ? He's going to say this a couple of times outright, and in a few of his letters, he will say something to the effect of, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's going to call them to keep a, he's going to call Timothy to keep a close watch on himself and on the teaching, to guard your life and doctrine. 
He goes on to say in verses 12 and 13 that we should be prepared for opposition. And the best preparation for the opposition that the church faces is to hold fast to the scriptures. This is where it gets good. Look at verses 14 and 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The sacred writings. Hold fast to the scriptures, the Bible, which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But praise be to God that he doesn't stop there. Not only is the Bible, not only is the scriptures, the sacred writings, able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ, it goes on. In fact, Paul goes on from there and he gives us these, these final two verses from which we, we flesh out that doctrine of, of sola scriptura. So let me give you four implications of this doctrine, the doctrine of scripture alone. I'm going to give you all four and then we'll go back through each one. First, it is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. Second, it is true and it is without error. Third, it is our highest authority. And fourth, it is sufficient. It is inspired by God. It is true and without error. It is our highest authority. And it is sufficient. So look now at these last two verses of chapter 3. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We believe that the Holy Scriptures are inspired by God. They are God-breathed. Focus on that first phrase. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. That phrase, all Scripture is breathed out by God, as it says in the ESV. Some other versions say inspired. But breathed out by God, I think, is the, the best literal translation. But what does that mean? What does it mean that Scripture is God-breathed or even inspired it doesn't mean that scripture, scripture is simply inspiring. Rather, it means that Scripture actually has God as its source. That's important. It has God as its source. Now, on the face of it, we could just leave it at that, right? Until you come across somebody who, who says, well, how do you know that? How do you know that Scripture has God as its source? Let's look at the words that Paul says here. Notice in verse 15, he uses the phrase sacred writings to refer to the scriptures that, that Timothy has been acquainted with since childhood, that he's been taught by his mother and his grandmother, he tells us earlier. Sacred writings, that phrase sacred writings is how the Hebrew people nearly always referred to their scriptures. Uh, that's what we, call, what we call now the Old Testament, right? Uh, Genesis through Malachi. It was the Old Testament that Timothy would have known and been taught since he was a child because, frankly, the New Testament had not been written yet when Timothy was a child. Maybe parts of it, but certainly not all of it. He, case in point, he's writing this letter. But here in verse 16, when, when he says all Scripture is breathed out by God, Paul uses this word, Scripture, that was commonly used by, by the early Christians to refer to both Old and New Testaments. So Paul believed that all Scripture has God as its source, but so also did the Apostle Peter. So, for example, in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter tells the story of, of witnessing the transfiguration. When Jesus was changed into his glorified state, he was one of the few who witnessed this. And yet, even after seeing this miraculous, incredible, awe-inspiring event, he writes this in, in his uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 19 to 21. He says this, as opposed to that, he says, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. To, do which you, uh, to which you would pay, do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture come from, comes from someone's own interpretation. 
For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but spoke from God as, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are not merely a human product, he's saying, or the product of the, of the will of man. Instead, he says that they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And when they spoke, when they wrote, when they, when they put down, when they put pen to paper, they spoke from God. This is what Peter believed. Later in that same letter in 2 Peter in chapter 3, he's going to call Paul's writings Scripture. He calls Paul's writings Scripture. Peter believed that Paul's writings are given to him by wisdom, God's wisdom, not man's, and that they are on par with the sacred writings of the Old Testament. He believed that the Holy Spirit led Paul to write those words. But if we can't trust what Paul or Peter say about Scripture, let's look at what Jesus says. In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. The last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out this. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now, what is Jesus saying here? It's kind of a strange setting and situation. And without getting too technical, let me just tell you what he's doing. He is saying that the, the feasts of the Old Testament, this, they were just finishing up one of the feasts, that they point to him. That the scriptures point to him. That's what Jesus is saying here. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow li rivers of living water. But listen to how the people responded because there's a little bit of irony. So this is again from John chapter 7, verses 40 to 42. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Can you, can you kind of catch the irony in that? The irony is that Jesus was born where? Bethlehem. He was from Bethlehem. But the point that I want you to hear in all of this is that the people were looking to the scriptures to tell them who their Messiah would be. And then probably the most illuminating verse on Jesus' view of Scripture is this famous verse, Luke 24, 27, which on the road to Emmaus, after he had risen from the dead, he's walking along and he's overhearing some disciples talking about all that had happened in Jerusalem in the past couple of days. And he starts telling them, verse 27 says, "...and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures." The things concerning himself. In other words, both, both Jesus and the Jewish people believed that the scriptures were about the Messiah and that Jesus is the Messiah. They believed, even if they didn't accept him, most of them, they believed that the scriptures told them who the Messiah would be. They just didn't think he fit the categories. Listen to what he says about his own words in John chapter 12. He says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus' words are equal to God's words. Let me just say it a different way. Jesus' words are God's words. Now think about this for a second. You kind of have to put all of these things together. What I am saying is that Jesus believes that everything in the Old Testament either points at him or shows us our need for him. Shows us, tells us who God is and who man is. And that we need a Savior because we are great sinners. And that Jesus is that Savior. He also believes that if anyone does not receive his words, <clears throat> then that person actually rejects all of God's words because they're one and the same. So with Jesus, it's either all or nothing. 
You can't pick and choose. To reject Jesus' words is to reject God's word. All scripture is breathed out by God. And if you reject any of it, you have to reject all of it. And if you reject any of it, you're calling Jesus a liar. There's a movement throughout Christianity to accept the red letters. This Bible is actually a red letter edition Bible. I like it because I can glance down and see that it's Jesus speaking, but it's not the color of the ink is not inspired. And there can be mistakes in the color of the ink. But the red letters aren't, aren't really more important than the rest of it because it's all God's word. We can't just accept the things that Jesus says and reject the things that Paul says, which is common today. We have to accept all of it. And if we do not, then we're calling Jesus a liar because Jesus believed that God's word was true and that it was without error. This is the second thing we need to see here and know about the scripture is that it is true and without error. In, in John 17, 17, Jesus says, he prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And Jesus prayed those words to his father for his disciples. Your word is truth. The big words that you'll sometimes see are inerrant and infallible. And, and this is this is kind of so straightforward, it's almost funny. Your word is truth. Except it's not funny because there are people who claim to be Christians who would say that, for example, there are mistakes in the Bible. We can't really believe all of it. We certainly can't believe the creation account. We can't believe some of the things that Paul said because he obviously didn't like women. Or even worse, there are those who would say that the meaning of the Bible changes over time, that it is a living document. Those same people, I don't want to go down this road, but those same people believe our, our U.S. Constitution is a living document. It's the same type of idea. But there is an absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we've already established that Jesus believed that all of the scriptures in both Old and New Testaments were God-breathed, were inspired by God, and that to reject any of them is to reject all of them. And what this rejection of the truth of God's word does is place man as judge over God's word. What it does is accept as authentic and binding only those portions of the Bible that you agree with, that don't offend us. But remember, there are things, as we said earlier, there are things that, that don't offend us as a society now that used to offend us even a decade ago or less. There are things that are celebrated in society now and have months dedicated to now and flags made for, and you get the idea, that used to offend average people, even unbelievers were offended by. The Bible hasn't changed. People have. As we have slipped further and further away from God's truth. So whether it's a church leader, um, like a pope, or a bishop, or a pastor, or if it's some kind of council, if it's a church tradition, or if it's just an individual preference, a denial of the truth of Scripture is based on sinful, imperfect knowledge and understanding. If we deny the truth of Scripture, if we deny, that can't mean what it says. That can't mean what it says. If we deny Scripture, we're basing that on our own imperfect and sinful minds. When people decide for themselves what to recognize as true and right, when people decide for themselves what to recognize as meaningful and relevant, they take away the authority of Scripture, and they take away the truthfulness of Scripture, and they take away the inspiration of Scripture, the God-breathedness of Scripture, and at best, the Bible then just becomes a guidebook. Too many people in our society and in our own hearts, we sometimes look at the Bible just as a guidebook. It tells me how to live when I want it to. God's word is true and without error because it has its, as its source the truth, capital T. 
God's word is true and without error because it has as its source the truth. The one who is the way, the truth, and the life. I need to reiterate that the words of Scripture are true, not just the ideas behind them. People like to twist this doctrine, this understanding. But these are not God's ideas simply passing through man's words. These are God's words. And and just as a kind of a really brief side note, we would acknowledge that there can be mistakes and scribal errors in translations. Um, Some translations are better than others, but in the original writings, they are completely without error and are absolutely true. Um, When the King James Bible in the early 1600s was first being put together, it was a very famous Bible mistake, translation mistake. It's now known as the Wicked Bible. They left the word not out of one of the Ten Commandments. And so that commandment read, you shall commit adultery. That Bible edition was quickly pulled from the shelves, fixed, and um, is what few copies are left are actually worth a lot of money now. We believe that the Bible is without error, but there can be mistakes in translation. That's why we have so many different translations, by the way, that help us to understand um, the scriptures. And when there is a mistake like that, it's usually quickly found if it's something that contradicts. That's actually really rare um, that that has happened. In fact, we still know about it because it's so rare. Um, Most of the uh, mistakes don't actually um, change any of the doctrine any of the teaching of the Bible, They're just sort of different ways or different emphases or something like that. And, and often, and especially in the newer translations, there'll be a footnote with a note at the bottom that say it might also mean this. This might be a better way to say this. Um, I'm sure you've seen that. The scripture is true and without error. Um, and that that phrase True and without error is a doctrine that is a necessary consequence, really, of the doctrine of inspiration. See, if put this together. If the Bible has God as its source, then it must be true and without mistakes. And if those things are true, that the Bible has God as its source, that it is true and without mistake, if those things are true, then what naturally flows from that is that the Bible is our highest authority. It's our highest authority. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 19, Jesus said this. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches uh, teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, the the Roman Catholic Church uh, put final authority in matters of faith and practice in the hands of a man, in the hands of the Pope. That's why it makes headlines in our day when the Pope, referring to homosexuality as he did a few years ago, says, who am I to judge? Or when when it comes out, when the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope or, or some bishop or something comes out in support of evolution. Because according to their doctrine, the Pope has the authority over the clear teaching of Scripture. He's even able to contradict it, or what they usually do is spin it. And I'm not just, I know I'm picking on the Pope. He's an easy target. We do this in our hearts. We read the clear commands of Scripture and we we disregard them or we say, ah, that's not really about me. Or we don't even even think about it being about us or being for us. We think it's for somebody else. But if the Bible is the inspired Word of God and is true and without error, then then we don't have the authority to, to decide to oppose the Bible and to run our own lives based on our own sets of standards. Jesus says there that even the smallest letter or stroke of the pen is accurate and will be authoritative until heaven and on earth pass away. That's an idiom. It's a saying. We would say, until hell freezes over. 
which is not going to happen, just to be clear. Until all of God's plan has been fulfilled. Until all that that God predicts, that the Scripture uh, predicts or foreshadows, until all uh, that it commands and requires, God's Word stands as the final authority in our lives. What Jesus is doing in these verses is affirming the authority of the whole Bible for all time. He is teaching here that if we are to please God, then we are to teach and keep the Bible's commandments from the greatest to the very least. He is saying that the scriptures are the absolute authority for the people of God for all time. Tradition, is, or the way that we've always done it, is not our highest authority. We, we value the writings of the, of the church fathers of Augustine, for example, but not as authorities in and of themselves, but as witnesses to the meanings of Scripture. We value the the creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, but not because they are authoritative in and of themselves, but because they reflect the teachings of Scripture. The church has authority in the lives of believers. The, the, the Bible, Jesus, gave the church the keys to the kingdom. And it's the church that has the authority to preach the gospel, to administer communion and, and baptism. But the church is subject to the scriptures. In fact, the source of our authority as the church of the living God is found in scripture. So the church is not our highest authority. Reason is not our highest authority. The ability to think, and it's valuable, obviously, but there's a massive conflict between faith and reason in our society. Have you considered these things? Reason, human reason, eliminates the idea of so many doctrines of the Bible, the Trinity. Human reason cannot wrap its mind around the Trinity, right? We so struggle to explain the Trinity. Human reason eliminates miracles. Our minds, we look at the miracles of the Bible and say, nah, that that didn't happen. That couldn't happen. Virgin birth. A literal six-day creation. Because you know what we're doing in so many of these things? It's not just reason that says, yeah, that can't happen. We actually put science above the authority of Scripture. Our world is doing all of these things very subtly. Science says that a man who's been dead for three days cannot rise from the dead. Science says he's dead. Our human brain says he's dead. Jesus rose again. Whenever science comes up with a hypothesis that is opposed to the Bible, human reason, our brains, will try hard to to turn that hypothesis into a scientific law, yet the Bible is our authority. Because the Bible is true and without error. Because it has to be true and without error if it has God as its source. And if it has God as its source, then it has to be authoritative. And you know what? The Bible's also sufficient. It's sufficient. So circle back now to these verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The sufficiency of Scripture all that, all that we need in the way of doctrinal, moral, Christian life in the church training is found in Scripture. The 66 books of the Old and New Testaments are sufficient to equip the people of God, as Paul writes there, for every good work. Not just some good works, not just most good works, every good work. It's profitable for for doctrinal instruction, for for teaching, for explaining the scriptures, for instructing us in what God says and what God means. When Paul writes profitable for teaching here in verse 17, it's the same word that he uses in Romans 15 verse 4, which says this, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have 
hope. You're not finding hope in the news. Even though we look at it every day, probably multi scroll to it every day multiple times, we're not finding hope in the news. We're not finding hope on social media. We're not finding hope in thinking good thoughts or positive vibes or whatever. We find hope in the scriptures. When it comes to godly living and to service, what Paul calls in Ephesians 6 verse 4, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, God-breathed scripture provides everything we need to live as God would have us live. And it gives us Just uh, this weekend, last night when we were setting up this table, we usually have communion set up on it. And it was sitting there. It's always there. And um, didn't have anything on it but the tablecloth. And for some reason I thought, you know, we've got these, these big old Bibles I should get out. There's one here and there's one on the table out there. I don't know if you've looked at them. Um, they've been here at Logansville Church, I'm guessing, 100 plus years. I'm not sure when they were published. They're kind of fragile. Um, sometime in the 1900s, because there's a 19 in the date. There's no writing, no handwritten date isn't written in. Published early in the, in the early 1900s, probably. And just before this session, or between the last two sessions, Brenda and I were talking about that one, flipping through it. And there's a science textbook in the beginning of it. I think that's the same in the other one that's back there. I think the interior of the books are the same. The bindings are a little different. It's a family Bible. There's a science textbook in it with pictures of animals. And I picture early 1900s, frontier America, Logansville, families sitting around Bibles like this, learning about animals, crocodiles and such, that they will never ever see, hopefully not, at least in Logansville, Learning about God's creation using God's Word. We don't do that kind of thing anymore. We go straight to science if we want to learn about science. And, and the Bible has become just another textbook. If you want to learn about Jesus and how to, be, how to love your neighbor, well, that's even changed because the world tells us we have certain things we have to do in order to love our neighbors, certain things we have to wear, etc., you want to learn about God? Go to the Bible. But if you want to learn about the world, if you want to learn science, if you want to learn about his creation, we have to go to this textbook or that textbook. And I, there's value in studying science. I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't at all. But are we going to God's word? Is it our highest authority? Are we teaching? Are we bringing up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? That's what Ephesians 6.4 is about. It's about dads bringing up their kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Without biblical teaching, it is impossible to know what you believe or why you believe it. It would be foolish to attempt to live a spiritual life without being people of God's word. Without knowing the spiritual truth. You know why all of this is so important? Why I really wanted to talk about the, 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 the doctrine of sola scriptura, of scripture alone? Why it's important? You know why it's important for the preacher to preach God's word? Why it's so important for the believer to hold fast to the truth, capital T? Because in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, he says. In these last days, there will come times of difficulty. Biblically untaught believers are easy prey for false teachers. They are, as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, they're children 
tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, God said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Scripture is sufficient, is profitable. It will teach you who God is and what he has done. And it will answer the question, what must I do to be saved? So let let me summarize and close like this. The scriptures are sufficient to reveal to us the truth and the will of God. In conjunction with the Holy Spirit, in fact, the Holy Spirit and the scriptures always work together. In conjunction with the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures are the primary vehicle with which God works in our lives. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, gives us the truth of God regarding Himself, about man, about sin, about salvation, about eternity. Scripture is our highest authority because it alone is the voice of God for us. It is given to us by divine inspiration, breathed out by God himself. It is sufficient, making us wise unto salvation and equipping us for every good work. The scriptures are given to us as the very breath of God. And whereas God breathed into Adam the breath of life, the scripture breathes into us the breath of new life, of eternal life. What must I do to be saved? This is the basic question. The question I hope your kids are asking you, or or will one day. The question I hope your neighbors are asking. What must I do to be saved? Scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who's believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Scripture is the most important tangible thing that we have. I think Gabe said... This morning, that for hundreds of years, Christians didn't have their own copy of of the Scripture. For hundreds of years, if they could read, they didn't have a copy that they could read. They would come to church and someone would preach, read the Scriptures to them. How many Bibles do you have in your house? You don't have to answer that. We got it made. We can get fancy Bibles with leather covers and our names engraved on them. And praise God for that. We need to hold fast to it. We need to not take it for granted and we need to spend our time reading, studying, meditating, and sitting under the preaching of the Word of God which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that we would hold fast to your word, especially as we see the day drawing near, because we can look all around us in these last days and we can see times of difficulty. We have seen believers, even in the Western Hemisphere, even in the United States and Canada, places that we would never have assumed would happen in our lifetime, we have seen them arrested. Christians for for preaching, for gathering the saints. We have seen um, 
Christians in the East who don't have the Scriptures or maybe have a page torn out that they smuggle and they have one bit of your word. We know of churches, Lord, around the world where they're not able to assemble and sing loudly for fear of arrest. Lord, we pray that you would help us to not take these things for granted, but that we would hold fast to your word. Not just because you have so richly blessed us with um, our freedom in our nation, but Lord, because it is dear to us, because it is able to make us wise for salvation and equip us for every good work, because it is your breath breathed out and profitable, not only for teaching us, but for correcting us, for reproving us, for training us in righteousness, in Christ-likeness, that we might reflect Christ. So, Lord, I pray that we would be a people who hold fast to your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.